public health embraced this idea of a noble lie, mm. right? If I, I lie to you about the efficacy of masks, why? Because otherwise you won't wear them. Mm. I lie to you about whether the vaccine will stop transmission. Why? Because you might then otherwise not get the vaccine. Yeah. Those lies undermine trust. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall at The Spectator in London. I explore taboo topics and speak to heterodox thinkers and uh, as well as exploring free speech issues. And my guest today is one of the most censored men in the West, I believe. It's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Welcome, Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you for having me, Winston. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, as well as being a uh, well, you're a professor at Stanford University Medical School, a uh, physician, epidemiologist, health economist, public health policy expert focusing on infectious diseases and vulnerable populations, but famously one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration in October 2020, which, as we know, well, we sort of knew already, but as was confirmed by Barry Weiss in the Twitter files, was censored by Twitter and we believe other uh big tech companies, uh, you've, you've experienced censorship from YouTube. Uh, and um, I learned also that you've been censored for, by reading your latest tablet magazine article, uh, you've experienced censorship at Stanford University where you teach and work, all of which I look forward to getting into with you. Um, uh, and also keen to talk about your experience going into Twitter post Elon's takeover and, and that experience. Uh, but I think we should perhaps start with uh, your uh, let's, the work that is so controversial, which which is not only the Great Barrington Declaration, but the zero prevalence study of April 2020, which also got you in uh, in trouble. So maybe you can you can explain to our listeners uh, what you set out in those in those two uh, sure uh, things. So in uh, when the when the pandemic hit. Uh, you know, I've been writing about uh, about infectious disease uh, and infectious disease policy for two decades. Uh, I I remembered what happened in two thousand nine during sw the swine flu epidemic. That, that there was a uh, in the early days of the pandemic, the World Health Organization said that 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 the death rate was like very very high um, in two thousand nine from the swine flu. And and uh, uh, what happened was that there was a whole series of studies that was done. Uh, where people would measure antibodies in the population at large. The antibodies, what they tell you is that, uh, is that uh, look, you've had the disease and recovered. Your, your body reacts to it um, and, and produces antibodies. So what you do is you just go in the population. You say, okay, how many people out of the people I sample have antibodies? Um, turned out for H1N1, the flu, the, you know, the, the swine flu, a uh, hundred times more people had been infected than people re than, that, that, that had shown up as cases because it was for most people it was relatively mild, then it just was a cold. So they didn't, they didn't go to the doctor. Doctors didn't know about it. Public health didn't know about it, um, and that meant the death rate was really low. And but it took a long time before those studies were done. Initially, there was a big panic over this swine flu. So I ran a study in the early days of the pandemic uh, uh, for COVID. So I thought, okay, well, what if this is a very infectious disease? What if the same thing is true that many many people have had it, and we just didn't know about it? Uh, so in in, uh, in Santa Clara County, Cal County, California, where I live, in LA County, uh, I ran. I helped. I was a senior author in in um, these kinds of studies. Um, what we found was it wasn't like a lot of the population. It was about like three or four percent of the population in April of 2020 had already had the disease. Hmm. That sounds like a small number, but that was really controversial. Like for a couple of reasons. Like one is that it meant that the death rate from the disease was something like 0.2%, 99.8% survival. The World Health Organization had been saying 3% death rates. Uh, the, the, so, I mean, that that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I mean, was, and the other thing was like, there was this big age gradient. Older people were much, much more likely to die from it than younger people. That, that was clear even before our study. Um, the other, the last really controversial thing about that study, uh, the result of the study was that, you know, 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but April of 20, early April 2020, the disease had only been in the country for an hour, a month, month and a half, mm -hmm. and already 3%. Mm -hmm. There was no way to stop it, right? That meant that, yeah. that the population was going, was going to be infected. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that there, uh, and the only question was, who do you protect in the meantime? 
as the disease spreads. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, why was that so controvert uh, controversial then? It, if you're a scientist, you're studying these things, it's, it's literally your job. Why would that be offensive to anyone? And what were the professional repercussions? Well, I mean, it was, it was actually quite painful. So um, uh, the, the, uh, I, it, it was a big media hit. I mean, like people probably won't remember now, but like back, back in April 2020, it felt like the central media story. A huge number of, of, uh, of, of media outlets paid attention to it. Uh, it was controversial because it, it meant that public health was already doing the wrong thing. That the lockdowns that we started in March of 2020 had not worked, despite them, three or four percent of the population already had been infected. Mm -hmm. Right? That's you know two three weeks after the lockdown. That's a bad result. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that public health had was that everyone needed to comply, and partly they used fear mongering to do it to over overstate the true death rate to get people to be scared of the disease so they comply with the lockdown orders. I mean, I think part, that was part of some people's minds anyways. Um, and we're, we're coming around saying 0.2%. Well, that's, you know, 0.2% is not zero. I, I'd rather it be zero, but it's it's not as scary as 3%. Yeah. Has the 0.2%, is that now, has that been proved uh, uh, still to, is that still? Yeah, sorry? I mean, like, there's now dozens of zero prevalence studies um, in some places like New York, where there's older population, there was they, they found higher death rates. Uh -huh. In other places like in Africa, they found lower death rates, uh -huh. which was younger. Um, that 0.2% is like roughly the median estimate. So like, you know, most of the studies find something something very, very close to that. Right. So at, so were there repercussions at Stanford? Or what, what exactly happened when you put out the, the seroprevalence? So I, I started getting attacked by, by the press. Like there was this BuzzFeed author that wrote a story attacking my wife because she'd like written an email to try to help people know about this. I mean, she did it with my permission, but like she was, had, met, had good intentions. And she created a, some scandal out of that. Uh, the, the, the founder of JetBlue gave that $5,000 to Stanford for the study. Um, and somehow she turned it into this, like some conflict of interest as if I'm going to change the results of the study. The BuzzFeed journalist. Yeah, the BuzzFeed journalist. Uh -huh. Stanford then opened in, a, like what they initially called an investigation. Then they turned it into like a fact finding mission. As soon as they found we'd done nothing wrong of me, it was tremendously stressful. I mean, I, you know, like I, I've just never had anything like that happen to me before. Wow. Like I've, I've been publishing dozens, you know, I published 150 studies or whatever in my career. Um, I'm a professor in good standing. It was really, it was very, very stressful. Friends of mine turned on me on the basis of that study. Really? Yeah. And um, why do you think that, why do you think that they turned on you? What, what was so offensive about it? I mean, I think they just, they, they very strongly believed that it was a very high mortality disease, that, that we'd clearly done something wrong. And they, they for whatever reason, decided I was a, a bad guy uh -huh. um, for, for, for having done the study. Okay, so fast forward a, a few months uh, to October and you, publish a one sheet, the Great Barrington Declaration, arguing against lockdown policy. And what happened, what happened then? So that one, that the reason we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, so the Great Barrington Declaration is a very simple idea. Um, you know, there's, there's this, just as I said, this thousand fold difference, older people are much higher risk of disease of dying if they get the disease. Um, same time, the lockdown strategy we've adopted have been tremendously harmful to poor people, to children, working class people, uh, you know, closing schools, for instance, there was an April 2020 or April, May 2020 study by very, very, very well known pediatrician. Um, yet when you close schools down for a short time, you think that, okay, it's not such a big deal, but in fact, it is a big deal, uh, especially poor kids who don't, who can't get replacement, but even, even, even anyone, everyone, every kid, uh, you, you deprive them of learning. And that has lifelong implications. Like there's a big literature in, 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 uh, in education policy and health policy that, that documents how important it is for kids to go to school, like full time, in person, all the time. Um, when when you, they don't go to school, they end up living, uh, they end up being poorer, they end up living shorter, less healthy lives. Mm -hmm. So the estimate was we robbed in the United States just from the spring closures, five and a half million life years of, from children. That was a, that was a wow. pa published paper in like you know spring of 2020. Who published that paper? Uh, the Journal of the uh, Journal of uh, of the American Medical Association Pediatrics. I think it's, it's this guy named uh, Dimitri Kostakis, who's a very famous, uh, very, very well known pediatrician. Um, uh, he was actually the editor of that journal. Um, and and then for for uh, you know the UN World Food Program was saying things like. 
the, the economic harm from the lockdowns are going to cause tens of millions of people to, to go into dire poverty worldwide. You know, you say supply chain disruptions. The pointy end of that is somebody who's making, you know, $10 a day of income or uh, in, in Uganda or something. They're out, they're thrown out of their job because the supply chain at which they're at the bottom breaks and now they're starving. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like they're like they're yelling as loud as they can. There's going to be starvation from these lockdowns. Um, all these like people are skipping their their cancer exams. You know, so so like so women are going to show up with late stage breast cancer that mm -hmm. should have been cured. So, so the Great Barrington Declaration said, look, you shouldn't do these lockdowns. Mm -hmm. They're going to cause more harm than good, mm -hmm. um, especially for people who are low risk. So you have a you have a identified high risk population, older people. You have this harmful policy that's de devastating poor children, working class people. Um, and uh, the obvious strategy is protect vulnerable older people, mm -hmm. like move heaven and earth to protect them. And we had some, a lot of ideas that we gave in the, in the proposal, in the Great Banshee Declaration itself and the accompanying material. But we also wanted to invite public health to, in, to enter that conversation. I mean, they, they know how the local living circumstances of the elderly in their community are. Mm -hmm. They would have a better idea than us how to protect them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then for the rest of the population, lift, lift the lockdowns. Yeah. yeah. So what was the reception then? Because in this country, the co-authors, uh, Sunitra Gupta, am I pronouncing that correctly? And Martin Kuldorf, I, th uh, w I believe were uh, brought to Downing Street and had a uh, reception with the prime minister at the time, or if not the prime minister, so someone. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sunitra actually, she went to number 10, actually just, just before the Great Barrington Declaration, right? She, okay. Yeah, so she- um, To discuss- the, the, well, so not, not so. The declaration happened because Martin Kuldorf, who's a professor at Harvard, um, had had uh, he uh, he just invited me and Sunetra to come to some little conference mm -hmm. where we were just going to discuss the right with the right strategy. But we'd mm -hmm. already arrived basically at the strategy. Mm -hmm. The strategy. Uh, I just tell you, it's the least original thing I've ever worked on. <laughs> I, it's the old. It's, it's it's it's. I mean, it's the old <laughs> pandemic point. Like it is. It is. There's nothing. There's nothing really novel in it. Mm -hmm. We wrote it to tell the world that there were scientists that disagreed with the lockdowns. Hmm. We wanted to shatter the idea that there was a consensus when there wasn't actually a consensus. Many, many scientists I knew were unhappy with the lockdowns, uh -huh. were afraid to spe say, speak up. Uh, many people were uncomfortable with lockdowns, but- in Afraid the, to speak, scientists afraid to speak up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wow. mean, you have people like Tony Fauci who controls you know tens of billions of dollars of funding for scientists but and you actually not just the funding um I, I i guess it's like francis collins the head of the nih the reason the reason is they also control the social status of scientists yeah of course. you can't run your you can't run your experiments you don't get nih funding actually you don't get you don't get tenure at, at, at big universities mm. um so it's 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 uh it's it's almost like career suicide speaking up when someone like francis collins or tony fauci says, no, no, you can't, uh, that we, we have to do this. We have to do the lockdown. Just as a little bit of a side point, what's the, amongst scientists, is it a majority of scientists who are talking to each other but keeping quiet? Or is it a minority like yourself? Are you in a minority of, of dissenting voices or, or heterodox thinkers? What, what's yeah, I mean, I, th I think if you asked me in October 2020, I would have said, yes, we're in a minority. There are a lot of scientists who disagree, but we're in a minority. I, now I'm not sure. I'm not sure that even in October 2020, we were in minority. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the evidence for that is that when we put the declaration out, tens of thousands of scientists signed on to it. Almost a million people have signed it, mm -hmm. uh, regular people, but also you know, like Nobel Prize winning scientists, uh, infectious disease epidemiologists have signed. Tens of thousands of doctors have signed it. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, the, the, but, and at risk to their careers, like people who put their names on the front page, some of them lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. the, many of them lost opportunities to sign for grants, uh, you know, collaborations, teaching, they were ostracized in their, in their communities. Wow. Um, just for signing it. Just for signing it, right, for, or having this heterodox idea in the midst of this pandemic. So what were the other, uh, how was the other reception then? How, how do we get from there to you being uh, shadow banned on, on Twitter? Well, so four days after we wrote the declaration, the uh, the head of the NIH, Francis Collins, wrote an email to Tony Fauci, you know the famous Tony Fauci, uh, calling me, Sunetra Gupta of Oxford University and Martin Kuldorf of, of Harvard University, uh, fringe epidemiologists. Mm. For, a friend, so actually, it's, which is kind of funny because well for lots of reasons. But my friends of mine made cards for me. You know, it says you know like I'm going to have it on my 
epitaph. It says fringe epidemiologist. <laughs> um, uh, the, the irony is that we were just proposing an idea that was the strategy used for a, you know, a century of a respiratory virus pandemic. It was really the least original idea I've ever had. Um, and, uh, and, and, and somehow it's fringe in, this, in the midst of this pandemic. Um, he called for a devastating takedown of the premise of the, pan, of the, of the declaration. And uh, then I started getting calls from media asking me why I want to let the virus rip. Why did I want to kill old people? Uh, it was just an unfair reading. Like we were calling for a conversation about how best to protect old people. Mm -hmm. We're calling for a conversation to, to acknowledge the harms that were being done to children, to poor people, to working class people. Um, and instead it was this demonization by the very head of the NIH. This head, essentially someone with tremendous power uh, abused it mm -hmm. to try to essentially like the idea was like, you know, like to, to when he writes, Tony Fauci says, we're fringe epidemiologists, you, uh, calls for a devastating takedown. Tony Fauci then responds uh -huh. with like a, 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 a Wired magazine article attacking us, slandering us. Fauci wrote it himself. No, he, he, he I mean, I don't know for certain, but he, like, you know, he, he starts showing up in a lot of these articles where he's like essentially slandering us, huh. accusing us of wanting to let the virus rip. Um, I mean, uh, Colin shows up in articles, call, as, as in effect, calling us fringe, fringe figures. Um, they're sending a signal to other scientists to stay silent. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be, you know, it'd be terrible what would happen to your career if you were to speak up in this with the way these guys did. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, they're government officials. So they work. Uh, and what, what was happening at this time is that the government, the United States, and I think also the UK, is they're desperate to control the converse, the scientific conversation about COVID online. Yeah, this actually did happen in, in the UK. And there's an article written at The Spectator by Isabel Oakshaw. She ghost wrote the uh, our health secretary at the time, Matt Hancock's pandemic diary. She claims that as early as January 2020, Hancock was in contact with Twitter about affecting the algorithms. He contacted former Lib Dem Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, who was at Facebook, apparently agreed. And um, when your co-authors were at Downing Street, apparently he threw all his toys out the out the pram. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We, we we had the same thing over here. So what you have then is government using its power to control the speech of private citizens. And that's a that's a direct violation of the American First Amendment, I, in my view. I mean, like you just you. It's one thing for Twitter to decide, okay, we want to control the, the parameters of what speech is given privately, mm -hmm. right? But that's not what happened. What happened was that they took instruction from the government. Um, I'm, I'm part of a lawsuit filed by the um, uh, Louisiana and Missouri Attorney General's Office against uh, against the Biden administration. And in that lawsuit, we, we've got to depose Tony Fauci and, and a number of very high um, administration officials. We also got to read a lot of email interchanges between these high officials and social media companies. Through the lawsuit you've been Through the lawsuit. Because they've had to reveal them. They've had to reveal them. And what, they, what we found is that there was direct communication where the government is telling the social media companies what to censor, in some cases, who to censor, mm -hmm. like very directly. Um, the government was desperate to control the conversation, to create this illusion that the that the policy they were following had a scientific consensus behind it. Mm -hmm. That that's why we had the attack on us mm -hmm. after we wrote the GBD. It was because the the effect of the GBD was to shatter the illusion that there was a consensus. Right. Well, there uh, just to color in the atmosphere at at the time. I think Biden said. I think in summer twenty twenty or summer twenty twenty one, he said social media companies were killing people because they were allowing the spread of misinformation, which is actually in contradiction to what you've said is that censorship is is what kill, uh, kills people and i'd like to get into that but so you discovered that this uh, was this lawsuit specific to the gbd or was it to, to do with the youtube uh yeah no this was broader broader than just the gbd so like so we, we published the gbd the google, google in many countries actually if you typed the great brand like we went we, we published it online right so and then we got like dozens of people sending us translations of the this one page document mm -hmm. into their language 
but if you went in to Google in in uh, you know in, in some other countries, you type Great Barrington Declaration and whatever, the, in, and what you'd find is that the search results were like incredibly biased. The the uh, uh, GBD main page was on page three or whatever of the Google search, mm. and all these hit pieces were above us. Mm. Um, and uh, Facebook, we had a little Facebook page. Facebook actually took it down for a week without telling us, giving us any reason why. Really, um, you know, and and uh, I mean, it, it it was really clear that social media want, worked to try to suppress knowledge of the GBD. Mm -hmm. So, you've now been into Twitter. Elon Musk invited you in uh, because, uh, and, and Barry Weiss signaled uh, singled you out on, on as an example on her Twitter files back in December of someone explicitly uh not shadow banned isn't the, the term what's the term it's uh, blacklisted black trend blacklisted trend blacklisted so they stopped your tweet from being able to trend what did you discover at twitter uh, the, the, well first I, I i i got to talk with some of the twitter engineers i discovered that so i joined twitter in august of 2021 um, I, for various reasons, I had never been on on Twitter before. I was like, I figured writing scientific papers is the way you move people, but uh, I, I guess Twitter is the way you move people. Um, anyways, I, like, <laughs> I get you I, in trouble too. I, I, yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Um, uh, so I signed I signed on uh, with with the idea of reaching people I hadn't reached before, right? To tell people what my view of the of COVID science is, my view of COVID policy is. Um, I, I got a lot of followers almost immediately. Uh, for scientists, it was it was you know it was like a, a, a ridiculous number of followers it seemed to me, but you know but but I'd been in 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 um, like on on on, on like uh, some TV shows before, so maybe that's why people heard of me. Um, but what I noticed was that I would send a tweet and only my followers would see it. I was very rare that I would get people outside of my you know sort of the one degree following move me for me that would see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, my tweets would never go viral in the way that, uh, that 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 you might be expected for someone who's like trying to tweak the. I mean, I was very careful on Twitter. I didn't. I I thought I knew what the bounds of acceptable. I, I suspected that there was censorship going on, mm -hmm. so I knew what the bounds of acceptable conversation were. Like I, I didn't say like the the vaccine causes you to be magnetic or something or something silly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so but I but I did say is that the, the these lockdowns are causing all these harms, and I was linking to scientific papers to show that show the harms right i was advocating for the great parenting declaration it didn't reach those uh, the the followers outside of the ones i had it didn't because the trend blacklist it turns out was placed on the very day i joined twitter mm. wow total coincidence <laughs> we don't know like they just well i mean like why would twitter put me on a trends blacklist i mean their job they get they get a benefit from having a lot of engagement I'm generating a lot of engagement for them. Yeah. With these, what what looked like controversial ideas. Well, they were like, you know, vanilla ideas actually, but whatever seemed controversial at the time. They look vanilla now. Yeah. yeah. Um. But th but so that but then um, so I don't think it was ever in Twitter's interest to suppress it. They were doing it on the behest of the government. Like, why would they suppress me on the put me on a blacklist on the first day I joined? Is this your thinking of what you've learned now? Because that's what I learned now. Yeah. You're, so. They, you don't think you would have been censored had they been left to their, if they hadn't had government influence. Yeah, I think if there was no government influence, they would have left me. I mean, you know, I'm a Stanford professor. They, there's, there's just no way by themselves they would have decided that I was so outside the bounds that I need to be put on a black. It's not inconceivable because there are other examples where they were acting. If you look at how they took down Trump from Twitter, there wasn't government. Well, I think there might have been. but I think there, there, was, there was government there, pressure. There, there was government too, pressure yeah. there. But I think that... They, they were themselves considered themselves activists and 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 were acting ne not necessarily with government. To, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, a lot of a lot of you know, like a lot of Silicon Valley is controlled with from you know from the left, like their polit left political views. Um, but I think even when the left, there's this mix of there's still a, a, a reverence for free speech, like some 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 you know. I, I don't think, I mean, of course, there's some authoritarian left that wants wants to control speech and thinks some speech is so dangerous it shouldn't happen but there's still you know like a lot of big tech is founded by people who had very strong ideological commitments to free speech mm -hmm. and there's still enough of that left over that i just don't i it's i find it hard to believe i mean i, I could be proven wrong but like i i find it hard to believe that they'd move so far as to say we want to suppress all speech
Mm-hmm. Right. Some speech is dangerous, you know, like physical threats to people. Obviously, you want to suppress that. that that's reasonable to suppress. Um, but like, you know, like a scientist talking about his results or, or, or scientific results on the central scientific policy question of the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just I find it hard to believe that they on their own would decide to suppress that, so- especially since I wasn't putting conspiracy theories out. I was I was not saying the vaccine uh, makes you magnetic or you know, there's microchips. In it. Well, I'm not saying anything ridiculous. I'm just saying, here's the harms the lockdown caused. I, I actually, I, I did write that the vaccine doesn't stop disease transmission. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when it became abundantly clear from the scientific, I think it was like in summer of 2021 where I started writing about that because mm-hmm. um, it was an important topic, but I was reflecting what the scientific literature was saying. Did you get in trouble for that? No. No, I, well, I was I was on the continual blacklist. So I mean, I'd be a you know, doctor. So you go to San Francisco, into the Twitter offices. This is post Musk takeover, and can you talk me through that experience? That was surreal. So like, it's uh, you know, I think he laid off I mean, thousands and thousands of workers. But when he first signed on board, um, the headquarters itself is like this palatial estate. In fact, like a five star hotel or something. Huh. It's empty. Like there's nobody in it. There's like all the there's, there's this huge dining area. No one's in there. Downtown San Francisco. Yeah, downtown San Francisco, and um, there's a the, like the I, I went there on a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon, and uh, there was a few engineers like sitting there. Like it was like it felt like a newsroom or or like like there was just a buzz of like they're trying to keep the thing going. Mm-hmm. Um, Elon Musk is in a in a conference room huddled with with other engineers they're talking about i don't know what they're talking about some 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 engineering thing about how to keep twitter running um and then uh uh he meets with me for an hour Mm -hmm. uh it was it was surreal it was really interesting because i want i was really curious to find out why is he doing this like i you know like on the i live just south of san francisco so like i'm driving up for an hour it's about about you know 45 minute drive up and that whole drive i'm thinking okay it it cost forty four billion dollars for me to come to come to the, do, yeah. do this little drive. Um, so so, the question is why? Why? Yeah, do you why do is it? he doing it? I, I think he honestly wants free speech. Mm-hmm. Like he was, he's you know, for him, um, a society that doesn't have free speech can't science engineering advances can't thrive. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it's like, I mean, I think he views it as a civic obligation. That's why you know, I asked him, like you know. You're 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 doing you're revealing of these kinds of things. I mean, I'm not going to sue Twitter because I'm I'm really pleased with what with the, this openness and transparency they have, but he's opening himself up to Twitter 1.0. Did did a lot of bad things. They suppressed people. They shouldn't have suppressed them. They leaving them themselves open to like all the lawsuits and things. And he's like, yeah, I know that, um, but it's worth it. It's mm. worth it for free speech. Oh, because he could be sued by what happened at Twitter. Yeah, because he is together. he's now the owner, uh-huh. so he's responsible for what they did. Right. I see. Um, so wh- what uh, what else did you learn in that hour about uh, Elon? Well, I, th- I mean, he's he's very clearly, a, you know, very much against lockdowns. Like he, and he's, I think he's been against lockdowns from the beginning. So he he, like, did he know about you from the Great Barrington Declaration? Never heard of us before. He'd never heard of He'd you? He'd never heard of the Great Barrington Declaration. Okay. I mean, so, he, I mean, I think he since has heard, but like, yeah, he hadn't heard it at the time. So how, how did he know to invite you? Because Barry Weiss. Okay. So she, uh, I, I met, I've known her for, for probably a couple of years, she allowed me to write stories for her. For her, um, uh, uh, which was the thing called the Free Press now, um, which was just a fantastic outlet. Uh, but she, uh, but uh, so she, when she, when Elon invited her to come report on the Twitter files, she wanted to find, she wanted to write about prominent scientists that were that were censored. Mm-hmm. So she searched for me, and if, and, and uh, my main, you know, my name came up as the Twitter blacklist. She she put. That she put me as like one of the the the, the only scientist that was like in, in her in her list that she'd had that was uh, that was censored, and so that that's how I think Elon must have learned about me. I see. So you did you have any insight about the machinations of Twitter and and is it bots that were doing the censoring? Was it individuals? What insight did you get there? It's a, it's a mix, right? So I think the, most of the censoring is done by AI. Right, mm-hmm. so like someone sends in a list of words, trigger words or something, you know, five G or something, and now now like the, the the AI will say, okay, this is something to to to, to flag, uh-huh. or or censor automatically. Um, 
but there are a, a ton of requests from media companies to, to censor. You can see that in the, in, the, uh, in the database that they have. Media companies. Yeah, people, people work for media companies. There was like, you know, reporters wanting to sense things censored. Reporters or, wanting to suppress speech. Yeah. What, what example? Do you remember I, having examples? I, I mean, the, I don't want to bring the eye of Sauron on me, so I'm not going to like name names, but like it just, it was, the, you know, it was, just, 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 it was like, you know, um, yeah, the, the, these these notes from saying, okay, this 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 crosses the line, this that that crosses the line. You should you should you should suppress this. Um, I didn't see anything directly from governments in my in my time at Twitter, but other people, other you know, reporters who've actually gone there and, and done this, have found notes from government officials. Yeah, about who to censor and what to censor. Oh, we know that now. It was yeah. uh, it wasn't just the Biden administration, the Trump administration as well, and and. Uh, the DNC and various governmental groups, absolutely, and, and, and that was revealed by Taibbi and, and Barry Weiss in the in the, in the Twitter files. Um, so, what was the story with YouTube and DeSantis? Because you, you were also censored there, am I right? Yeah. So, I still can't I still can't wrap my mind around this. So, so um, uh, in March of 2021, Governor DeSantis invited me to a policy roundtable. And the question, one of the questions, there were several questions, like one on whether there should be vaccine mandates or or, or, or not. Um, it, absolutely not. Um, a bit, but uh, one of the questions that came up where the governor asked me directly was, is there any evidence that masking children has any effect on disease spread? I knew he was going to ask me this because he'd given me, prepping me a little bit with the list of questions. So I, I looked up the literature. There are no randomized studies documenting any benefit at all to masking children none still to this day so that's why i said i said look there's no there's no scientific there's no high quality scientific evidence suggesting that that, that we do that. and at the time all these like in the united states especially there's like craze of masking children as young as two years old um you know toddlers so, um and uh and i, I was just reflecting what the scientific evidence was saying right so, and and the, it's a sitting governor of a state asking his science science advisors the scientific basis for policy decisions that he's about to make. Mm -hmm. YouTube. So there was a there was a, 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 a TV uh, uh, channel that was like filming this event. I mean, it wasn't all that exciting. It's just scientists talking to a governor, right? But, but on the other hand, it's like it's kind of a good government thing. You can see what your governor. I'm from California. It was my governor, but his. But people afford could see what the governor, what advice the governor was getting directly. It's actually that's exactly what we want to see, Absolutely. as far as transparency in government. Um, they put this TV, uh, this TV station put the the, the video on YouTube. Who the next day then they censored it. They cut. They they dropped this video. YouTube or the TV channel. YouTube. Wow. Censored it um, because of what I said. Because I said that there's no benefit, there's no scientific evidence that masking children has any benefit. Wow. Um, I mean, it's just it's mind blowing. Like the and and I I don't know directly it was at the request of the government, um, but it might have been like you know the, we might have tripped a keyword mm -hmm. or, or or something. But you just you can't have that. You can't have a you can't actually have uh, this a, a, a communication. Uh, sort of medium that's aimed at public furthering public discourse that censors the functionings of government mm -hmm. transparency yeah. sort of like transparent government even if you disagreed with me although i you'd have to then disagree with scientific literature but whatever even if you disagreed with me you you should get to hear what i've been saying to the governor right mm -hmm. yeah i mean this uh, all the more shocking that this is a country where freedom of speech is in the bill of rights it's <laughs> the right bill there of rights, yeah know, you'd have thought of in America of all places that this this couldn't happen now I, I want to go into the, the 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 greater implications of what censorship as, as a I've heard you say censorship kills but before doing that I think I, I want to understand what happened at Stanford University and you describe being uh, intimidated and uh, silenced uh, there um, in a recent tablet magazine uh, article would you mind um, uh, that, that was really painful to write Winston I mean, it was really hard to write um so Stanford is my home. Like I've been at Stanford for 36 years. If you asked me three years ago, is there any problem with with um, academic freedom? I would have told you absolutely not. Like I, I've given dozens of dozens and dozens of of, of seminars, uh, sometimes with very controversial ideas. It's 
I mean, you know, it's it's science, right? You're going to say things that people disagree with. You just you, you resolve it by thinking of experiments or find getting new data. It, it's it's fine to disagree in science, right? Um, during the pandemic, Stanford has did not organize a single seminar where people who uh, that were opposed to the lockdowns and there were very prominent people at Stanford opposed to lockdowns not just like people like John Unides the most the most high, you know one of the most highly cited scientists in the world uh, a Nobel Prize winner Mike Levitt Scott Atlas who was the uh, advisor of President Trump on COVID policy right some very prominent people who opposed the lockdowns none of us were invited to give a seminar on campus talking about our views. The, the leadership never organized a debate between us and people who disagreed with us on campus. They could have. Um, and what happened on campus was that, that essentially uh, uh, the views, especially Scott, when he went to go advise Trump, now all of a sudden Scott was the, was the you know, devil incarnate, mm-hmm. right? just for the sin of advising a president on, on, on COVID policy. Um, and on campus, those the views were seen as like so far outside the bounds you couldn't even bring them up, right? That's why that's why they didn't invite us for a seminar. Mm-hmm. Uh, after I advised uh, Governor DeSantis in that video, uh, you know, with, with that video that got taken down about about um, a, a couple of months after that, there was a big wave of cases in Florida. Every place on earth has experienced waves of cases. It's just unfortunately that's the way the nature of this disease. Um, there was a, a poster campaign where the, there was a picture of me next to the death, you know, the, the number of deaths in Florida, essentially accusing me of killing people in Florida. And they, they put it on kiosks all over campus, including a coffee shop that, that, uh, on campus that, that, that I'm known to go to. Rem- uh, uh, I'm reminded what you said was that masks didn't prevent this, the spread of infectious, of COVID amongst children. Yes. And they made the, the jump then to assume that you were res- somehow responsible for the jump in cases in Florida. Florida, yeah. Um, so that's pretty intimidating. Those posts, those flyers are sort of around campus. I, I, forgot, I, mean, I mean, yeah, at the time, like for almost for two years, from 2020 to 2021, I was getting death threats constantly. And I was getting just random people. Whenever I'd appear on TV, I'd get, a death, I'd get death threats, racist attacks. It was, it was just, now, I mean, it was just part of the background noise. I mostly ignored it. But then when the posters came up um, on campus, a, fr- a friend of mine, sent me a picture of it right next to the coffee house I would go to. It, was like, it felt personal. Like somebody was directly attacking me in the place, in my home. And I, I felt physically afraid to go on campus mm-hmm. for a couple of days. I'm like, after, after a couple of days, I'm like, okay, I'm, whatever happens, happens. I'm just going to go. Um, I, I called uh, the department chair. I told him, like, this, I, don't, I don't feel safe going on campus. But what can you do? You, you, you sent me to some advisor who told me to uh, reduce my online presence. You know, I'm like in the middle of this massive sci- worldwide scientific war. I'm not going to reduce my online presence. I mean, just it's part of the, I mean, it's just part of like, I have to communicate with the public. I be quiet. Yeah. That's the, that's what you need to do. Yeah, sorry, go on. I mean, that's exactly how I read it. Um, so it, it just felt like I was like first by not organizing seminars, they essentially delegitimized my view. Mm-hmm. on campus they created an atmosphere where this kind of demonization was were there many other seminars going on yeah there were okay. other seminars but lots of others on zoom but yeah they were on right okay on. um you, you know all, there were uh, there's something called grand rounds in the, in the medical school once a week you get one very prominent person get who's invited to report on their research or, or some ideas that they have to the whole of the medical school right uh, the, you know over the pandemic there have been you know 150 some grand rounds and you'd have thought, seeing as they have the one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, Johnny and Edie's, or I mean, they could, they should have invited one of us, mm. not one. Mm-hmm. So, so then uh, your 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 voice is being silenced. Then, although you're not actually having anything apart from sort of being told to be quiet is the best way to deal with the flies. Were there any other ways in which you were sort of silenced at, at uh, Stanford? It was. I mean, like during the, that that Santa Clara study, they, there was a there was a, um, 
that that that, that there was a allegation that uh, so what happened was like the, the the study was funded by a very large number of of like anonymous donors or or or, or, or small dollar donors. Hmm. The way that normally works, I mean, I'd never got all my funding before that had come from the National Institute of Health. I didn't, never experienced this kind of thing, but like we re we announced that we were doing the study and a lot of people wanted the study to happen. And so they gave a little bit of money to Stanford. Mm -hmm. So the JetBlue founder, you know, for this airline founder gave $5,000 to Stanford for the study. Mm -hmm. There was a Buzzfeed article claiming that somehow that money had, had influenced my, my reporting or, or that bias, the study was, I have no idea how, why, what direction or what, uh, it just, it makes no sense for $5,000. I mean, I didn't even see the money. It went to Stanford. But Stanford opened an investigation of me. Uh, but they, they very quickly turned it into like a fact finding thing. They found nothing wrong because I hadn't done anything. It was just, just, just it was tremendously stressful. I started getting like, you know, like friends of mine, pre, I guess former friends of mine um, started telling me like, you know, like they, they, they were going to defriend me on Facebook. It was that, that was the most silly childish so thing. So petty. Um, and then, but then, and then, like I heard there were a hundred, like that someone was circulating a petition, uh, and the chair of epidemiology circulated, uh, helped circulate the petition. It didn't quote me directly, but it quoted what I said during that DeSantis interview, um, saying that there's no high quality evidence, right, um, for for child masking. Uh, and, and it said, this is a dangerous opinion and asked the president of the university to censor people who, who have this opinion. Make clear this is, um, I mean, at that point, I mean, and a hundred of my uh, friends signed it. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I, I mean, some, some of them I didn't know, but met some of my friends, friends signed the thing. I mean, so it was, well, I have to be forgiving, you know, once I, I, I mean, I've, I've, I'm, I'm happy to man. forgive them. Um, but uh, it's hard to like, well, you know, it's just, it was painful, right? It was just, it was like, it felt the sense, sense of like, I'm being excommunicated from the from the uh, from the university. You know, I've been there for 36 years. I've been teaching for 20 years. I've written papers with some of these folks. Um, it was just it was it was just it was painful. I can only imagine. So zooming out then um, to this idea that uh, you know, as I quoted Biden earlier, he was saying that social media companies were uh, were killing people by not spreading. Uh, by not stopping the spread of misinformation. And you've said that actually censorship kills. For anyone who, who believes that censorship was the right thing to do in that scenario, what is your argument? And, and do you think that you can say, you can back that up scientifically uh, after COVID that actually censorship does kill? I mean, I, th I think the key thing is, um, I mean, it's hard to answer. It's hard to like, to to like make a counterfactual and be entirely persuasive, you have to like think what the world might have been like without it. Mm -hmm. But I, I I don't think there's a, I don't think if you think about it, there's a lot of controversy about this. Like so so the, uh, let, let's say take the argument at space about why censorship would be good, right? So some ideas spread that are incorrect, and sometimes people act on those ideas in ways that lead to harm to them, and maybe to others, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, like take some of the worst of these ideas, right? So like, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, early ideas about like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like the, 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 something President Trump said about, you know, uh, I don't think he exactly said this, but like uh, some people misinterpret, like interpreters like saying bleach would kill the thing and like maybe, maybe they, they drink bleach. Mm -hmm. right? that, that's, a, that's a harm of not censoring that idea, right? He didn't quite say that, but yes. Yes, yeah, so, so like, like yeah. someone could misinterpret it that way, right? Yeah, so, yeah right. Um, that that would be a harm of it. Mm -hmm. I, I if, like if you're if if you're honest, you say okay, I accept that that might be a harm. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the counter argument is that uh, if you have a trustworthy public health authority mm -hmm. that says no, no, don't drink bleach. Mm -hmm. Why you have to say that to like thinking human beings? I have no idea. But like, anyways, like that that you say that right. And people will believe it mm -hmm. because the public health authority is saying is is, is trustworthy, mm -hmm. right? The vaccines doesn't make you magnetic. It, there's not there's no five G chips in it, right? A trustworthy public health authority says that, and people believe it. And so you can counter the misinformation with trustworthy information from trustworthy sources. Mm -hmm. um, with censorship, what happens is that it breeds distrust in the authorities that are censoring. Mm -hmm. So when the authorities get something really substantively wrong, 
Like, so for instance, the authority said things like, if you are vaccinated, you will not get the disease and you will not spread the disease. Well, people saw from their own personal experience that wasn't true, yeah. right? I got the vaccine, two doses, mm -hmm. and then four months later, I got COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not the only one. I mean, uh, so now all of a sudden, the, the entities that are doing the censoring are no longer trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And now all the all of the all of these like not so smart ideas, they're not gone. They're just gone underground. And no one trusts the authorities to to counter them. Um and then, then there's another 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 argument, which is that um when you have censorship and and the the, the authorities get it wrong, mm -hmm. it takes longer to counter them. Yes. Right, so we essentially created with these vaccine mandates a two-class society, we like undermine trust in vaccines. What if they had allowed voices to to very early on to say, "Look, look, this vaccine doesn't stop transmission," mm -hmm. didn't censor that idea, it was a fact, right? Or that if you've had COVID and recovered, you actually have fairly good protection against COVID, mm -hmm. against reinfection, and uh, and certainly against severe disease on reinfection. Mm -hmm. Those were facts that the public health authorities essentially denied. Mm -hmm. I'd have thought that you might have linked this back to the Great Barrington Declaration because if you're you you're sort of arguing the damage that lockdowns would would uh, d that lockdowns did, and that 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 might suit your argument. I, I mean, I I absolutely think that that we would have won that argument much earlier had there not been censorship. Mm -hmm. Right, so I still talk to people who don't have never heard of the Great Barrington Declaration. Mm -hmm. Didn't still don't know that there was a scientific insurgency, I guess, against the lockdown idea. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. And it's absolutely right that, that I think that uh, we lost that that argument. We lost the policy argument in October 2020 mm -hmm. through foul means. Do you feel that now, looking back two years on, that you you still believe you were correct? Uh, do you, is there any sort of evidence that you can you can proffer to suggest that you were correct? Yeah, I mean, I th I saw, like, so first the, the the fact of lockdown harms. I mean, everyone everyone's experienced them, mm -hmm. right? So you know, like in July of 2020, the CDC did a study that one in four young Americans had seriously considered suicide, right? So that like the the anxiety and depression that comes from what's the normal rate? Like three four percent. Wow. Okay, yeah. so that's a huge jump. It was a huge, it was an enormous jump, right? So like, um, and the you know like the, the 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 kind of like we you know we're social creatures. We need we need company. We need to be in physical presence of others. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, no matter how misanthropic you are, you need that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even like mis you know, you know, introverted scientists like me will will we'll need will need to like talk to people, right? So it's just it's just the way it goes. Um, uh. So everyone's felt that that harm, that lockdown harm, probably directly. Uh -huh. uh, the 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 idea of like schooling, well, kids have, lo have who were forced out of school, mainly poor kids for for very extended periods of time. They have tremendous learning loss. Measured, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've created this generational inequality that didn't exist that that existed before, but was exacerbated through through this through these lockdown measures on on kids. Um, in poor countries, in Uganda, for instance. Four and a half million kids never came back to school after two years of closed school. Wow. A lost generation. Many of them, like little girls, were sold into sexual slavery hmm. because their parents couldn't afford to feed them. They would often get food from their school. Um, the lockdown harms are, you know, like the economic malaise we're going through now, it's directly related to the economic policies we adopted, the spending, the printing of money, all of that the devastation of small businesses that happened during the lockdowns as a result of the lockdowns, right? So I don't think, I think the fact that the, those lockdown harms are undeniable, right? I think everyone, everyone agrees. That, 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 was, that was one of the main planks of the Great Barrington Declaration, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea that lockdowns wouldn't protect people, at, on near, I mean, what fraction of the, Amer of the American population or the, or the UK population has had COVID? Like nearly everybody has had COVID. How, what did the lockdowns actually accomplish other than maybe delay? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, and in, in terms of like, did they protect against 
deaths from COVID. Well, you can look at the counterexample of Sweden. Sweden didn't lock down. They had voluntary measures that guidance for, you know, they told people, they reasoned with people like adults and said, look, here's who's high risk. You know, you might want to be careful when the disease is spreading. Don't go out so much. Deliver food to your neighbor if they're older. So, I mean, things like that, like they, they created a community that was responding to try to like work together rather than these like, you know, these mandates and um, force. Uh, and they, their all cause excess deaths are lower than basically almost every other country in Europe, like maybe other than Norway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have a sense of injustice about what happened, the, the censorship of, the, of, of your work, considering how, it's, how it played out? I mean, I, I have a sense of sad, sadness. Though. Like, I, it's not so much me. I mean, like, I just, I feel, I, I feel like the scientific community let, let regular people down, mm -hmm. right? We didn't allow our normal processes to play through. We would have won that argument, Winston, if, we, if, it had been, if, if the normal scientific process, we would have won the anti-lockdown argument. We would have won the focus protection argument. Um, and instead, you had scientific bureaucrats abusing their position. Mm. for hubris i mean they thought they were right mm -hmm. and they weren't wow. um and so the the um I, and and the people who paid the price i mean i i, I mean I, I for me it's like it's okay yeah i paid some price with my you know i lost a bunch of friends but like also made a tremendous number of friends and contact like it's just in many ways scientifically it's been the most exhilarating time of my career mm -hmm. um but the kids that lost their opportunities for for schooling the people who lost their their small businesses, the, the, their life savings, um, the, the 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 young adults who who are like deeply depressed and isolated, uh, the 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 men and women who had late stage cancer and other should have been picked up early. All these people that were damaged by these policies. I mean, I felt I feel some sense of responsibility over this because we should have we should have spoken for. I mean, we tried to speak for them and we they weren't heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh now, uh, looking looking back, and, and the world has moved on, but uh, I wonder, as an epidemiologist, whether you could... Uh, I'd love to know your opinion on a, a couple of things that have now come up in the news. For example, the CDC are exploring a link between a, a Pfizer booster and uh, strokes in uh, elder people. And um, in Britain as well, there's a report of 30,000 excess death in the time March 2020 to August 2022. Now, we don't know whether that's because of the vaccines, because of COVID itself, because of uh, NHS problems and, and ambulance shortages. And, uh, uh, but I, I wondered if you had an opinion as uh, the efficacy of, of vaccinations and any damage they might be, uh, you know. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's likely that the, for older people, because they have such a high rate of death, I think the vaccines do reduce the rate of death from COVID. And so for older people, it's likely that they save lives. It's almost certain that they save lives. Mm -hmm. um, for younger people, it's a much closer question. I mean, it, it may not have. Um, I don't. I think for young men, it's pretty well established that the vaccine, especially the mRNA vaccines, cause uh, you know myocarditis, which can kill you. Like it's not. It's, it's not something you don't want. You, you don't necessarily want if you can avoid it. Um, the race is, there, of, is there evidence of that? Is, there's is absolutely strong? evidence of that. So, like, I think it's something on the order of one in three thousand, one in two thousand. We could, it's you, like, you could convince me it's lower than that, but not not much lower. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, but what that means is that for young men, the risk benefit calculation is like much closer to why do it. Um, I don't believe that the vaccines have killed a very large number of people. I, I just, I, I just, the evidence that I've looked at doesn't coincide with that but i do think that the vaccine should have just been targeted at older people mm -hmm. that's whom it benefited the most for younger people maybe the, the recommendation should have been go talk to your doctor if you have high risk conditions that make make it so that if you get covid it'll be bad for you then get the vaccines otherwise maybe not but if, if describe the scientific community as being so sort of captured in an ideology, was do you have any sense that doc, doctors might have been the same, medicine might be the same, or was was there sort of more sensibility, or was more sense rather in in in, in that world? No, there there was there was tremendous pressure on doctors to toe the line mm -hmm. on the vaccines, more more pressure than I've ever seen put on the medical profess, professionals to to say exactly what public health wanted them to say. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that, that would have been difficult. It would have required a different public health response. It would have required a public health response where doctors were treated as partners mm -hmm. rather than subjects. Mm -hmm. um, so what you, had, what, you, what, you, what you needed was a nuanced response that took into account patients' actual, actual condition. Like each, every person is different from each other. What may be right for you to take may be wrong for me to take, and vice versa. You're you're a young man; it's probably much less important for you to have taken the vaccine than it was for me to take it. Um, and and for when my 80 year old mom, much more important for her to take it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that kind of idea, public health could have just said that. Instead, it was there was this pressure that everyone had to be vaccinated, mm -hmm. with the false premise that if everyone's vaccinated, the disease will go away. Well, the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting the disease means it can't stop, you can't get rid of the disease with it. Therefore, it's not so important that literally everyone is vaccinated in terms of like the herd immunity idea. Um, that, I mean, that they, public health just made a mistake there, like a, an enormous mistake and it took them for, it's, they still haven't corrected it. Mm. Um, thinking more sort of positively for the future now, have things calmed at, at Stanford? And uh, do you feel that now that we're past covid somewhat that you are freer now with your at what you're able to say and given also that we've got this revolution happening at twitter and perhaps in tech you you online you'll be you'll be freer or is there still a, a sort of legacy from that period where there are circumstances where you cannot speak freely uh i mean at stanford um there still hasn't been an acknowledgement that that the, by the leadership that 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 they essentially violated the mission of the place. The like mission of the place is, to, is, you know, the motto is like, let the winds of freedom blow. Mm. The winds of freedom didn't blow for three years. I, I, I do think it's opening up some. I still haven't been invited to give a, a seminar uh, with uh, my, uh, like people who were in favor of the lockdowns. Like they still have not organized that kind of seminar as yet. Um, but there was a conference of, on academic freedom at Stanford where I got to tell my, my story it's starting to thaw, um, but there needs to be some acknowledgement by current leadership. I actually think there needs to be change in leadership uh, to, to a set of people who are leaders who actually, actually are committed to the mission of the university, which is to free expression of ideas in pursuit of knowledge. How can there even be pursuit of knowledge? Like, how can you do your exper experimentation if you not able to talk you about it. So what's right. the you atmosphere? It's ridiculous. It's, it's sort of I, th insane. I think a lot of a lot of people at Stanford just want to move on, pretend like the last three years didn't happen. Um, I don't think that's healthy. I think that we need to do a, uh, an honest conversation about we had to have an honest conversation about what happened, and make sure it never happens again. Like we have to recommit to our. I mean, this is not. I mean, this is Stanford. I'm, we're talking about Stanford because it's my home. But like, but I think it's just it's a broader conversation for our, our Western democracies. Yeah. And the universities, more, the universities the proper audit of what happened yeah. over the last three years, yeah. Um, uh, like for me personally, 2022 and 2023, the the death threat stopped. Um, the it look it moved a lot more. Like the policy moved in the in the direction of the Great Barrington Declaration. Like in yeah, in the UK you had what like Freedom Day in in like uh, what, July August of 2021 or something. Yeah, I'm not sure how many people are celebrating that, but well, yeah. it's a way to go, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I mean, the point is that, like, that, 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 the, the, the idea that we have to suppress the virus at all costs, that essentially is dead now in most places. Even China has gotten rid of that idea, right? Um, and it happened rather more violently over there. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they went for this crazy zero COVID idea. It was hopeless and at great cost to their society. For what? This is a virus that, you really can't, it eventually is going to spread everywhere. If you can, if you're going to devote resources to protecting it, you should just devote it to protecting the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. And once we have the vaccine, I mean, that's easy, right? What you do is you, the va you vaccinate older people who are high risk. The Freedom Day policy actually made the, actually quite a bit of sense. Like the idea was like, okay, UK had vaccinated its older population, lift the lockdowns. Because the older population is now protected by the yeah. end of the vaccines. The, the U.S., we just, I mean, the blue states, we kept going. I'm not entirely sure that's what happened in the U.K. And, and this, I'll, I'll reference back to the article by um, Oakshot about uh, Hancock. Because she describes him as having made so many orders of vaccines that once he had 
finished with the elder people, he then wanted, went on a mission to vaccine everyone else. And so perhaps he kind of got, went on an ideological yeah. uh, routing or something. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, there, there was, there was, there was, there was, I mean, the pressure in the US was even more, right? So like vaccinate kids as young as like six months old. Um, why? I don't know. I mean, like, they don't really don't really need it. Um, you know, six month olds don't really die at very high rates from like banishingly few six month olds died of COVID. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know the motive exactly, but I will say it was epidemiologic. It was the wrong thing to do. Like there was no reason to pressure young people to get vaccinated. And the idea was like, if I, if you don't get vaccinated, you're going to put me in danger. Well, that was, that was, that was not true, right? If you'd had COVID before and recovered, actually you were better protected against getting the disease and spreading it than it's an, a vaccinated individual who never had COVID before. The vaccine then also doesn't stop you from getting COVID. We created this two-class society for nothing. Public health did that. And, and the pressure to vaccinate was tremendous, right? I mean, you're absolutely right to, to correct me. Like the Hancock bet definitely did that, I mean, in, in the UK. Um, but it eased up faster than in California, for instance, there's still like, there's still like in New York state a couple of days ago, the governor of New York was asked, well, why are, why don't you hire back the nurses that you fired during the pandemic who were unvaccinated? You're sure there's a shortage of nurses in, in hospitals. Why not bring them back? And she still said two days ago, a couple of days, or like or yesterday that, uh, that the vac that these nurses put their patients at risk. Mm. Like we we, we created an underclass of unvaccinated people. Mm. Wow, and you still, and so that still exists. I think it? I think it still exists to some extent in the U. I mean, it's, start, it's starting to lift, but it's but um, it, it's it's still the echoes of that are going to go on for a long time. There are a lot of people who don't, who no longer trust any vaccines because they feel discriminated against on but by, by public health mm -hmm. who got. The facts about this vaccine wrong yeah how do you do you still trust them do you how have you do i trust public mind? health <laughs> yeah i'm a scientist i'm supposed to be skeptical um I, I think public health i mean it is the norms are different right so like public health is uh it's not just doing science they're also like communicating science and the practical applications of the science to the population at large so there is an element of trust and faith that they have to have my view is that the best way to, to garner that trust and maintain it is by telling the truth 100% of the time, even when it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. When you get it wrong, transparently admitting that you got it wrong, treating the population like adults. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what public health, I'm like, public health embraced this idea of a noble lie, mm -hmm. right? If I, I lie to you about the efficacy of mass, why? Because otherwise you won't wear them. Mm. I'll lie to you about whether the vaccine stopped transmission or, or whether if, if you're COVID recovered, if you have any immunity. Why? Because you might then otherwise not get the vaccine. Yeah. Those lies undermine trust. Yeah. Uh, reasonably undermine trust. And if you think you're fighting some great evil, the noble lie is, is, always, is always justified. Yeah. Until, until, until like no one believes you. Yeah. Which is, I, th I mean, it's not no one believes public health. A large fraction of the population is like, who are these people? Why do they think they know it, know it all when they've been wrong so many times? Mm. Well, a world in which we tell the truth 100% of the time, I think is one <laughs> I uh, hope will come into being. <laughs> okay, 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 fine. Like in our own pop, it's like, it's hard to like, but, but like, but for, for, uh, for public health, like professionally. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just, no, I wasn't actually joking. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're, I mean, you're right. I mean, that's, that is, that is exactly the right norm. And we just we just utterly failed at that. Mm. I'll, I'll still tell my kids, when, well, my grandkids, when I eventually have them, that Santa Claus exists. But that's, <laughs> that's another. Thing. Well, on that note, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure listeners and watchers will have found that fascinating. Thank you too. Mm -hmm.